Well, thank you, Leon. Yeah, it was wonderful to be back in this beautiful country. Because uh, South Africa, definitely, I'm more... Uh, last time I've been to Russia in 1989. And last time I've been to South Africa, last year, twice. So, uh, so and I'm, it's, it's a wonderful country with wonderful people, um, of all kinds of people. It's, it's an amazing place, I think. It's, it is, it is, I think that's where the future is being made. Uh, and it's very nice to be with the Free Market Foundation again. And I was listening a little bit about my bizarre background. And uh, I have a really bizarre background. I worked, well, worked is overstatement of my activities, definitely. <laughs> because I worked for Soviet government. I think working for any government is an overstatement. It's kind of no <laughs> and, uh, and so I was, a, I was an economic advisor, one of economic advisors to Mr. Gorbachev's government. I wasn't the advisor, I wouldn't take the blame for what happened over there. Uh, because can you imagine that in the United States many economists are talking about too big to fail. They even have an abbreviation, it said TBTF, too big to fail. That means if too big to fail, that means government should go and bail this failure out. And that's what our government was doing uh, promptly. And it was something too big to fail, definitely there was Soviet Union, because Soviet Union was the biggest thing in the world. And not many people realize Soviet Union was 11 time zones, 11 time zones. Uh, it's uh, about twice bigger than United States and Canada combined. And completely ruined by its own government without any external help. <laughs> and, uh, and so, um, that's, I don't like the word to defect, to defect, I mean, it, not just because it sounds like defecate, but it's also <laughs> because it's also it tells you that I gave up something I believed in, which was never the case. Uh, because uh, um, I would say I was politely kind of maybe correct me on that. I just missed my train, not defected. Uh, and why did I miss my train? Because I, when I worked for the Gorbachev's government, I realized that this program of perestroika does not lead us anywhere that it's a phony program that's ill-devised and misimplemented. Besides that, I had some kind of personal grudge against socialism in the Soviet Union because my grandfather was murdered by Stalin in 1937, being accused of being a Japanese spy. And when he was being shot, he was all the time just repeating that he never saw a Japanese person in his life, but he would like to. Because of that, my father's life was completely screwed up uh, he couldn't get an education at that time, uh, at that time, and he got his education only after Khrushchev denounced Stalin in 1956. In 1956, uh, because uh, Stalin, not many people realize, 1937 issued a, a very fancy kind of memo decree uh, with a self-descriptive title uh, that apple and apple tree, and his point was that apple doesn't fall far from the apple tree. If you're killing parents, you should kill children as well. That was the essence of that, of that wonderful decree. And then today I want to talk about, yes, and then I, when I defected to the United States, I found myself working for the second largest bureaucracy ah. of this planet, for the federal government in Washington, D.C., in the Congressional Think Tank, U.S. Institute of Peace, which, like, all, I think, congressional think tanks didn't think at all, just period. <laughs> I don't know where they were tanking a lot, but, <laughs> but thinking was not on agenda. And so I decided to do something at last, something positive with myself, and since 1991 I'm teaching at Cartage College in Wisconsin. I'm teaching young Americans ideas of liberty, ideas of founding fathers, ideas that Leon and Eustace devoted their lives, and Herman devoted their lives in promoting. Um, that's ideas of liberty, ideas of equality, ideas uh, which I think uh, the future is, is for these ideas, for these ideas. And for me, definitely, it's a great honor to be here at the Free Market Foundation, one of the nicest places, I would say, on Earth. On Earth. <laughs> and, <clears throat> Uh, today, however, we see a global assault on liberty. I would agree with Leon, however, that, that uh, Leon is an optimist. He's an optimist. And in this case, 
I would say that Russian proverb about optimists and pessimists does not work. Russians usually say that optimist is an ill-informed pessimist. <laughs> <laughs> or, <laughs> or, vice, or vice versa. But I would say that that uh, Leon definitely is very well informed. And I would, uh, I would also agree, and even uh, I was recently uh, reading a completely worthless study by the World Bank. The World Bank is famous for, for worthless studies. <laughs> but even they, even they were forced to admit by some kind of truth that today we have the lowest amount of poor people on this planet, less than 10%. It was never like that at any time in human history. Less than 10% of people on this planet are living on less than $2.5 dollars a day. Dollars a day. So this is a this is really really quite great an achievement. And having said that, <laughs> I would say that in South Africa you probably can live nicely for two dollars and fifty cents <laughs> because the exchange rate of dollar is just amazing. Yeah. Today I had a, I bought for, for late, for late uh, breakfast, I bought a, a hamburger in steer, and then they gave me a big box, and I opened the box, and there were two hamburgers, <laughs> and uh, for 30 rand, that means that each hamburger is less than one dollar, it's just amazing. <laughs> so I went, I said, you made a mistake, they said, no, this is a happy Wednesday. <laughs> 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 I would say that probably every day of the week in, in, in South Africa is a happy day with them, especially if you have a lot of dollars. <laughs> so um, today we see, I would say that we see a, a great, I would say, explosion of collectivism in the world. That's what I maybe would disagree. The crime is going down and incomes are going up. Less people are dying of infectious disease. Uh, but uh, from another hand, we see, I think, a frontal assault on liberty, mostly disguised under the guise of collectivism. You know that that we were all the time talking about, say, during the Cold War, in the in the terms of socialism, capitalism, or free markets, and and big government, or public slavery, and and and, and private enterprise. Uh, but today, I think collectivism is is on the rise in all kind of respects. We have all types of collectivism on the rise. What is a collectivism and what is not? Well, collectivist, the, I would say socialist uh, ideology and socialist program is, is, a, is the most visible and the most consistent type of collectivism. And uh, however, collectivism can take a lot of forms. Collectivism is religious collectivism. I mean, people who belong to the same religion, many of them are collectivists. I'm not saying that every religious person is a collectivist. You can be an individualist and religious person. But many of, of, especially when you have intolerant religions, when you have religions which are, uh, which are, um, are pretty militant, with religions which are not, uh, uh, which, which do not accept people of other faiths, faith, uh, then this, these religions are also, uh, uh, great form of collectivism. You have collectivism, national socialism, uh, national socialism is a, or, or Nazism, or fascism, it's another form of collectivism, definitely. Nationalism. Uh, so there's a thin line definitely between patriotism and nationalism, and today we see how the nationalism is on the rise all around the world. I would even attribute it to some extent to the failure of the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union collapsed, on the glorious day of 24th of December 1991, then uh, the world lost kind of a village idiot, I would say, <laughs> or a village drunk. Because when Soviet Union was around, it was easy to show at them and would say, would you like to be like that? And people would say, no, we don't. But today, you don't have, you have some exotic places like Cuba or like uh, North Korea. Uh, but they're not so prominent. Besides that, there's not much truth in in what do we report on CNN, for example. In Cuba, they lovingly call CNN Cuba uh, Castro uh, Network News, Castro's Network News, because of the lies that uh, they uh, perpetuate in Cuba. Uh, usually, I would take I would take my classes not to South Africa but to Cuba, because I was teaching um, was teaching um, uh, comparative economic systems. And Cuba is not an economic system. Uh, 
economics. Socialism is not an economic system. It's not an alternative. Uh, it, is, it is a non-economic system. It's a simple system of management. It's where people are working not because they want to or because they're paid for, but because they don't have a choice. So it's a system of public slavery and nothing else. So, uh, so the only why all socialist countries tend to be so murderous in the course of the 20th century from economics point of view, because you didn't have any incentives, any incentives. And if you, if you don't have something to work for, then you work only because you are told to work or else. And as or else, they murdered over 220 million people in all of this uh, exercise in collectivism, in exercise in collectivism. And I would like to begin our discussion with this quote. It's an it's interesting quote. I'm doing some seminars for the United for the federal government in Washington. And the quote is that we are socialists. We are enemies of today's capitalistic economic system for the exploitation of the economically weak with its unfair salaries, with its unseemly evaluation of human beings according to wealth and property instead of responsibility and performance. And we're all determined to destroy the system under all conditions. Who can tell me I will happily give 100 crowns for that? I don't think so. That's right. Yeah, very good. So I owe you 100. <laughs> so you, <clears throat> you already made 100% profit on, on the visit here. <laughs> uh, so this is a famous speech by Adolf Hitler uh, in 1931. It's a Nuremberg speech. Nuremberg speech. And, and he was absolutely right that national social and socialism uh, is both types of socialism. Both, both types of socialism. And, <clears throat> and what kind of types of socialism are these? Yes. Russians and technology do not work well together. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure, I would say. Uh, yeah, maybe it depends. From the it was a great Austrian economist, Ludwig von Mises. He used to say that socialism is not an alternative, is not an alternative to capitalism. The same thing as a glass of poison is not an alternative to a glass of milk. So they are not different beverages, it's just life and death. And so that was his point that this is, a, this is the most uh, the most uh, important thing for us to keep in mind that socialism is a system which repudiates civilization and it's nothing but nothing but system of public slavery public slavery what well, what is the idea of socialism that that you should have socialist revolution at that time socialist revolution was proclaimed to be to necessarily to be violent the idea was that that if you expropriate money from people or wealth or whatever, people will fight back. So you would need to eliminate these people. And that's what they were doing. Today, we have collectivism under other disguise that you can actually achieve socialism through the democratic process. There's a great Austrian economist, um, Josef Alois Schumpeter, who in 1948, he wrote his uh, famous book, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, in which he made a point that he is all for capitalism because capitalism is freedom. But he believes that socialism is inevitable because of democracy. Because if you, if you consistently implement democratic principles, then you would have socialism. For what reason? Uh, because it would be, uh, because uh, if you will have a majority rule, then uh, then uh, it's pretty easy to to vote out minority of the riches and of the property and of the whatever whatever it is. Yeah. And he died in 1950, and people thought that he was not right. But today we can see that it is very much kind of coming back, very much coming back. Socialist revolution that that we will have this uh, bourgeoisie would fight, the revolution will be violent. And then, uh, and then we will have communism. 
And here I think that many people in the United States and in South Africa do not realize what is the difference between socialism and communism. Many people think, or even my colleagues, many of them would say, socialism is actually good, nothing wrong with socialism. It's, it's communism is bad. Communism is bad, or fascism is bad, but socialism is good. <coughs> there was never such a thing as communism. Communism is utopia, it was never practiced. Never practiced, never occurred anywhere in the world. Uh, because um, uh, uh, what would the communist utopia be? That will have a classless society uh, without internal contradictions. The state would wither away. There will be no state anymore. We will have kind of a libertarian utopia. There will be no state. And, uh, and this is how Karl Marx described communism. Now, in communist society, nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity. But each can become accomplished in any branch he wishes. To hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, without ever becoming hunter, fisherman, herdsman, or, or, or critic. Uh, even uh, his, his friend, uh, Friedrich Engels, who if you know that he uh, bankrolled um, uh, Marxist, uh, Marxist work, or Marx work in, in London, uh, even um, Friedrich Henkel said, when do you think this kind of thing can occur? Uh, when we will have this wonderful society? And Marx uh, wrote him in a letter saying that maybe in 500 years from now. <laughs> so we still have 300 years to wait uh, for that kind of thing. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> speaking about that, I was uh, recently in a bizarre place called the World Libertarian Congress in Warsaw, Poland. And I was sitting next to a lady at the dinner uh, who was from United Kingdom. And she was a card-carrying member of the, of the British Communist Party. And I said, what brought you to the Libertarian Congress? And she said, this kind of, this quote from Marx, that it will be in 500 years. Because we think that libertarians are a free market, therefore free market. So free market can make capitalism right maybe a little bit earlier than 500. So we need to, to remove all controls on the market, and so the market will make capitalism ripe, and maybe already in 100 years, um, my children will be living under this kind of society. So this is the, the, the uh, it's, it's nothing but slavery masquerading on, on um, uh, as, a, um, uh, as, as a utopia. Uh, then uh, Marx was a rabid anti-Semite, amazingly enough, which uh, brings him very close to one of his students who was uh, Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler was a national socialism. He was combining two types of collectivism, um, uh, nationalism and socialism. And his nationalism was, was um, um, I would say, pretty aggressive nationalism. It was nationalism uh, um, which led to mass, to mass murder, to mass murder. And, uh, Yes, I don't even want to read that. That's quotes from quotes from Karl Marx. Quotes from Karl Marx. Interestingly enough, Karl Marx was kind of contradict, had a lot of contradictions in himself because he was himself a, a baptized Jew. So uh, Hitler, he he would not recognize Marx because he was Jewish, presumably. But it looks like Marx didn't like Jews himself. So this is, uh, and he was talking about something about racial trash in Europe. That in Europe we have some races and some ethnicities which are so much behind uh, in the understanding of the nature of society and economy uh, that they they are beyond repair. They should be replaced by others. Should be replaced by which is very Marxist kind of idea which I think Lenin and Stalin especially, and today uh, Kim Il-un or Fidel Castro and Raul Castro, they share. Um, I'm working in the Library of Congress uh, quite a lot on something called Volkogonov archives. There was a general of Soviet army, uh, Dmitry Volkogonov, who I thought is a propaganda person, uh, propaganda person uh, um, all the time talking Marxism and what not. He, uh, today only, I think, Rob Davis reminds me of him. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, then, uh, uh, and then it turned out that in 1980 he bought a Xerox 
for his, he was commander of Soviet Institute of Military History, the chief propaganda person about the army and military, whatever. And he put a, a Xerox machine in his, in the back of his office, and he was making highly legal copies of everything going through his desk. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, he approached the United States ambassador in Moscow, saying that I have 46 boxes of top secret materials that I want to move to the United States. And our ambassador, he said, well, okay, I will introduce you to the agency people, the CIA people. And he said, no way, agency, we'll put it in the Library of Congress, because agency can put it on the lead again. And so right now, this is fantastic, fantastic, absolutely, collection of, of the top secret Soviet documents. Um, and um, speaking about Marx and Lenin and Stalin, uh, Stalin, for example, is writing on the margins, usually, uh, his notes saying that, you want to reform these people? No, get rid of them. Much easier to make new ones. Um, then, uh, in other kind of things, he would say, um, he would uh, he would write, death of one is a tragedy. Death of a million just statistic, nothing else, nothing else. And sure enough, right now in in Russia today they are discussing how many how many skeletons they have in their cupboard. And uh, to some, uh, according to some data, uh, uh, confirmed by the KGB, 43 million people were murdered um, by, by Lenin and Stalin. And the foundation of American demographers, such as Rudy Rommel from the University of Hawaii, is 61 million people. So 43 or 61 doesn't make any difference for me because these numbers are completely beyond, I think, um, understanding of ordinary human of ordinary human being, and it's some. <clears throat> then, um, but we have a, there's a good Russian saying that, that the only lesson of history, the only lesson of history is that it does not, that it does not teach us anything. Um, and it doesn't, yes. Now we have, a, we have a, Uh, again, the same, yeah. this one, yeah. Uh, on the other one. Uh, okay. And I'm so sorry, we're switching between different presentations. And, uh, and uh, there, there's a good uh, Russian saying that the only lesson of history is that it does not teach us anything. And now we have, um, we have left and right competing in collectivist ideology, in collectivist ideology. We have one of our, uh, one of our contenders for presidency, uh, he is proudly socialist, proudly socialist. He, he recently made a point that, that um, he believes that incomes over one million dollars should be confiscated 100%. Uh, the tax rate on incomes over one million dollars should be, uh, there's, if you are interested in our electoral campaign, I'm not, I'm not a political scientist. Well, moreover, I think political science is an oxymoron. Uh, but, <laughs> but, um, uh, but from another hand, if you are interested, there's, there's a wonderful um, uh, TV vision station called Reason TV. Reason TV. And uh, they have a wonderful uh, interview with Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders is my favorite in economic illiteracy. <laughs> and, uh, and, they, and they show Mr. Sanders' interview, in which he's saying that we in the United States have 26 types of different deodorant, and we have 18 types of different sneakers, and children are going to bed hungry. And uh, that's, a, that's a fantastic video, at night you can watch it, because it shows a little girl, Hannah, which is saying, Old Spice is making another deodorant, and I will be hungry forever, and uh, on and on like that. And then they show the big building of the Bernie Sanders School of Economics, where education is free, but still heavily overpriced. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so we have we have all, all types of, of different. Uh, I think only Scooby Doo does not represent any collectivism <laughs> in this in this picture, but we have a lot of different. Collectivists. These are two, two more or less free market individuals. Uh, this one and this one. Uh, collectivism takes all kind of, all kind of uh, um, um, forms, all kind of forms. National socialism, 
uh, is responsible for, for mass murder during the fascist and Nazis time. And um, uh, what, um, uh, but if you will look at, if you will read my Kampf and other works by, by Hitler, you would see that what he meant is we have a socialist society for, uh, for uh, Nordic people only. Everybody else should serve that socialism. Uh, for example, Slavs or others, but they should be just slaves in the system of perpetuating the, the socialism for the few and chosen, for the few and chosen. Um, in uh, all socialist countries, most of them degenerated into the systems of public slavery. That also tells you why they were killing so much. Uh, because slaves can be an asset, but can be a liability as well. And so because of that, you know, besides that, as bad as private slavery is, uh, it does make sense for you to kill private slaves because it's a destruction of wealth. In the uh, Soviet Union, the slaves were, uh, everybody was, was owned by, by nobody, actually. And that's why it resulted in such a great mass, such a great mass murder. Then, uh, if you will look, this, uh, this is a, uh, for and foibles, this is Vilnius, uh, Vilnius, Lithuania, after the Soviet Union uh, collapsed, after the Soviet Union collapsed. And I, and I brought my Jitterm trip to Vilnius, and amazingly enough, we could take a picture of this, but, uh, but just maybe 300 meters on that side, they had the same monuments, so or fallen monument of Lenin. And, uh, and one um, entrepreneurial Lithuanian he put a little bridge over the Lenin, over Mr. Lenin, and, um, and my students could go in for a very thrifty uh, uh, sum of about 50 US cents. They could go and pee on Mr. Lenin, <laughs> and, which was pretty, pretty bad thing because, because that was uh, the, the, the kind of, um, I would say, discriminating females because they could. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is a, yes. This is another another form of socialism. I would uh, usually take my students instead of South Africa. I would take them to Cuba because Cuba was the best the best uh, inoculation against the socialist ideas. Cuba is completely destroyed by its own government. Cuba is um, uh, Cuba um, even for ex-Soviet Cuba is, is miserable. Cuba is miserable. Uh, average wage today in Cuba, they don't tell us, is nine dollars a month. Nine dollars a month. Can you imagine? Nine dollars a month is less than the United Nations poverty line of two and a half dollars a day. So these are the um, and, uh, <coughs> and, and and we have a lot of propaganda in the United States, the same as in South Africa, uh, praising Cuban so-called achievements. So. Or completely, completely deceiving people about that. Uh, we have the biggest propaganda person in the world, in the United States, um, which is um, this uh, Michael Moore. If you know, he's uh, even bigger than me. <laughs> and uh, Michael Moore here, he made this movie, um, Sico. Sico. I don't know if you watched this video. Sico about um, about healthcare in Cuba. And so when we went to Cuba, one of the uh, students in my class, uh, I, I have friends in Cuba, friends from my Soviet days. And so we speak Russian there and whatnot, because during Soviet days, uh, they would take young people from Cuba and educate or brainwash them in Moscow. And so some of them became pretty important people in Cuba. And one of them, uh, he asked me never to uh, mention his name, and rightly so, uh, he would talk to my, to my, to my group. And he said, uh, uh, and uh, he said, well, we, we have a wonderful, wonderful uh, 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 country, but we have some problems. And one lady, she said, well, we see problems are coming through the roof. Everything is a problem. But we heard that you have a great health care. He said, we have fantastic health care. Uh, it's the best health care in the world. But as a true communist, I can see room for improvement. <laughs> that if we would have doctors and medicines, and we would have ambulances, <laughs> and we would have hospitals, then it would be just absolutely perfect. <laughs> and, and, then, um, and then he, when we were exiting the room, he said, healthcare, healthcare, swim to Miami, that's the healthcare I know of. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So this is an ambulance in Cuba. You can see this. So this is you have a loved one who is sick, and you can move him right there. So these are the, the kind of the, uh, I will, what I'm thinking of that uh, in today's West, we have cultural Marxism. Not many of our politicians are saying that we should have another murderous bloody revolution as we had before. Uh, so, but we have a lot of people who, like Mr. Sanders, believe that you can combine democracy and socialism, that you will be democratic socialism or whatnot. And they usually point at Sweden, for example, or Denmark. Mr. Sanders himself was saying, like, look, he was asked, where has socialism ever been? He said, Denmark. And sure enough, that Mr. Rasmussen, who is the prime minister of of, of Denmark, he immediately issued a statement, don't badmouth Denmark. <laughs> we're, we're, a free, we're a free capitalist society based on free markets and free will of the people. Uh, what, is a diff what, what is really an, an indicator, what is really definition of socialism? Definition of socialism is government property, is the government taking over. So from that point of view, and which is shared by many, by Thomas Sowell, as well as, uh, as uh, the, the most interesting work on this was, uh, uh, was done by Hayek definitely, um, and Armen Alkian, especially in the uh, University of Los Angeles. Their point was that, uh, that government, every government is socialist institution. No, I mean, every government who does not have profit motive, it's uh, based on planning. It's a, it's a socialist institution. The only thing is that you cannot make it capitalist or whatever, but you can make it controlled by the people. You can make it small, and so you have less of that. And Soviet Union, they had more of that. They had over everything. The, the shoeshine stands were run by civil servants. So it was 100% of employment, 100% of everything was owned by government, including people. So even people were owned by, by government. That's why they were disposed so, uh, so generously. Um, so in the United States, we have mostly, uh, in other Western countries, uh, the followers of something called cultural Marxism. Uh, Antonio Gramsci, he believed uh, in Italian communist who was murdered by Mussolini in 1934. Uh, he believed that, uh, that you can you can have a cultural revolution without the violent revolution. You can just destroy everything, capitalist, capitalist uh, morals, capitalist ethics, uh, uh, just one by one. And that was, um, uh, he was very close to Ines Arman, a Swedish communist, who was the first commissar for education in the Soviet Union. In the Soviet. She was a Swedish communist, a very internationalist lady, and uh, her point was that that to achieve real collectivist society, you should begin. Uh, you should begin with religion first. It should go because if you are a religious person, you cannot believe in this. If you, um, I mean, that if you, you cannot be a Marxist uh, because Marxism, from her point of view and the point of view, I think of, of I mean, many people would agree with her that it is nothing but a secular religion, secular religion, because it cannot be proved. That's the difference between religion and non-religion. So, uh, so it was a second. And if you believe, if you believe in in um, uh, Prophet Muhammad or Jesus Christ, or you uh, you will not have enough space to believe in all this stuff as well. So religion should be to be gone first. And so the idea was uh, that religion is for the opium of the people. That's how that's how Marx qualified religion. And, um, uh, and religious people were uh, dealt extremely harshly in all socialist societies. In Volkogon of Erkheitz, there is a uh, memo uh, of uh, uh, sent to Lenin, a letter sent to Lenin by the Communist Party <coughs> organizer from the southern Russia. He is writing, Dear Comrade Lenin, you told us to fight religion, but you didn't tell us how. And Lenin is writing him back, he's saying, Dear Comrade Imbecile, Kill religious people, that's how. Postscript, and kill them the way that everybody would be trembling with horror 150 miles around. So that was the, the kind of the first thing. Then the second thing, 
family should go. That the family, uh, the family is was the second goal. And in Russia alone, in Soviet Union, there were 900,000 priests and, and monks and and and, uh, and nuns um, um, since Stalin in 1929 decriminalized murder of religious people. Uh, it was a special degree, uh, which is uh, which is uh, the title was fighting against social vermin. And the idea was that if, if you would go and kill um, a priest or a nun or whatever, you can take their possessions, you can rape his wife, you can do whatever you like to do, and then if the police would show up, they would just say thank you very much for cleaning our society from the social vermin. And so that's how they got rid of 900,000 of this. And then the family, the family definitely, because if you, if you destroy religion, if you destroy family, if you destroy civil society, then you're completely naked before the big government. Then they can do whatever, you don't have any support mechanism. And that was also exactly what was happening. Uh, the same in the summer, she wrote a book called The Glass of Water. The point was that love is nothing but bourgeois, disguised bourgeois prostitution. That family is nothing but exploitation of female by male uh, um, and children by parents. And, uh, and so that was the, the kind of the, the, the turning point. And what, uh, what was the alternative? Alternative would be glass of water. Because there's no such thing as love, only sex and sexual kind of uh, lust or whatever. And then people should meet at a certain point at the, at the, at the city if they want to. And uh, then make love to each other, or we'll go go through sexual intercourse. And then when you when you have children, the children should be taken away from parents and put not from parents, from the from the woman who gave birth, because this woman and that man should not even ask each other's names, because you are asking name, you are already uh, you are already kind of professing an interpersonal imperialism. You are claiming this person that love is nothing but but um, a claim of one person over another. Uh, so that was, uh, was, was her point. And, um, and fortunately, even Lenin, uh, yes. And so then, then these children would be raised in special incubators. And they would be raised in the belief that all adults are their parents. And um, adults would be told also that all children are their children, are their children. But you should not single them, single them, single them out. So this, I'm talking about that because we have revival of this strange uh, kind of ideas. Today in the United States, uh, we have a lot of things which, uh, which is very interesting for me to see. Not even interesting, but appalling. Because really, I defected to the United States in 1989. And I kind of exploded with DNA. I have four children in the, in the United States. And, and I'm too old to defect again. I mean, this is, so this is my kind of last stand. <laughs> so you can see that what is the, 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 that's what people are being taught and being uh, be, and, and learned. And Herbert Marcuse, George Lukash, uh, these are the, the uh, Then we have collectives. This guy is everything. as uh, climate change, as uh, socialism and whatnot. And so this is a, this is a salt on freedom that what I see. And uh, <coughs> Friedrich Hayek, uh, I would say for me, he's a, absolutely my hero. He uh, wrote a book, uh, Road to Serbdom, in 1944, which he dedicated to socialists of all parties. Socialists of all parties. It's a great book, and um, uh, and I am pretty proud that uh, I was invited. Uh, to speak about this on TV, and uh, uh, um, I was at Cartage. We have a program called the uh, the book that changed my my life. The book that changed my life. And so I was uh, was trying to hide behind furniture not to address this program. It's philosophy department at Cartage is doing that. But then they picked me out from this furniture and, and put me on the stand. And so I made a made a presentation on Hayek's Road to Certain, the book that really changed my why? Because, uh, because if you would get this book, if you would be caught in Soviet Union by reading this book, you would automatically get seven years of 
jail, seven years of, of hard labor in Siberia. And if you will be passing this book, you will get 12 years for dissemination of anti-Soviet slander. And uh, uh, Hayek, a Nobel laureate in economics, a great psychologist, also a great sociologist and constitutional <coughs> scholar, uh, he, uh, he dedicated this book to socialists of all countries um, and, and parties. So when I returned back to my office, I got a call from a certain lady, Virginia Grace. Um, I um, hate to say that, but uh, my cul cultural development stopped at the Leslie Nielsen movies. Uh, that's what <laughs> I really love. And, uh, and there's Virginia Grace in Leslie Nielsen movies. So I said, are you calling from Leslie Nielsen movie? And she said, no, I'm going from Glenn Beck show. I didn't know what Glenn Beck show because I don't watch television. I just uh, trying to keep my life expectancy uh, a little bit longer. And, uh, and so then, and then I said, uh, so what? And she said, uh, we would like to get you on the program. Because somebody advised us. And um, uh, what would you like to suggest? I mean, what topic? And I said, how about the road to serve them? And she said, the road to serve them? Uh, what is that? I said, it's a book. And she said, the book? Oh, um, that's not an interesting book. Um, I said, well, it's interesting. I mean, the road to serve, you can talk about a ditch or, or a U-turn or, or a dead end on the road to serve them, all kind of traffic terminology. Uh -huh. And she said, all right, I'll call you in five minutes. She's calling me in, in one minute. She said, can you come tomorrow? I said, no, I can't come tomorrow. I have a dinner. And uh, so next week. So I flew to New York, was on this program, which I never watched before. And uh, Mr. Beck, he was waving this road to certain book, saying, America, read this book. America, read this book. And next morning, I got a call from David Ramsey Steele, the great British economist. And he works also from University of Chicago Press, which holds the, the um, uh, copyrights for the road to certain. He said, what did you do yesterday on TV? We have 300,000 copies ordered already on the road to serve them. I was so much surprised that, that the TV programs can make such a difference. Yeah, so I uh, kind of uh, very, very happy to that I've been promoting, promoting um, <laughs> August von Hayek. Uh, because I could get seven years, now I'm giving extra credit for my students for reading, <laughs> for reading this, this wonderful, wonderful book. And sure enough, when communism collapsed in the Soviet Union, they published wrote a certain seven million copies, seven million copies. So then, um, if you will look, what are the kind of problems we have with liberty? We have a, we have a monetary and fiscal policy completely uh, completely disjoint, and in, in, especially in South Africa, you will see what is amazing that South Africa, I think it is kind of like a, a mirror for the United States that the problems are more or less the same. But in South Africa, they kind of magnified a little bit. I remember last year, I think I was interviewed by 702, 702. And they said, when do I think that, that South Africa will look like the United States. I said, very soon. They said, oh, you're optimist. I said, yeah, I think we will look like you very soon. With national debt, especially. And, uh, the government is spending like a, this is, for example, this is somebody at Heritage Foundation, which is considered to be a conservative think tank, conservative think tank. And they were saying, well, look what will happen. Uh, the debt would double on the Obama plan. That the debt would reach $12 trillion in the year 2019. We're right now in the year 2016, and the debt is $19 trillion. <laughs> so you can see that even Hedge Foundation more cautious than the World Bank is. Or? Yes, this is a national debt from, yeah, this. Um, Federal spending on low-income programs. The president yesterday was addressing um, the uh, Congress with the State of the Union address. State of the Union address. What are the what are the kind of the major highlights of State of the Union address? 50 million people on food stamps. It's expansion of social services. Isn't that great? Yeah, that's I think President Zuma is very happy that you have 16 million people in South Africa. Uh, who are kind of subjugated to this kind of public slavery as well. 
then if you will look at in the United States poverty line we had seven years ago, ago when, when he was just um, uh, came to the White House poverty on the poverty line we had 11 uh, 11 percent of the people now we have 19% of the people, almost double. Who suffered more? That would be black Americans, African Americans. Would, would, um, they have the complete decline in absolute and relative incomes. Absolute and relative incomes. We never experienced 65% unemployment among black teenagers. And the president is suggesting that we should increase minimum wage until $10.10. And then that would would definitely would have, would like 65% is not enough, then what, you should have 80% or 90%? Uh, or doesn't he understand that raising minimum wage increases unemployment? This is just amazing, amazing. Here in South Africa, fortunately, you have, you have people like Herman, who is right now suing your government for gross violations of labor law, uh, of, of labor law, which is, which is uh, unconstitutional. Unconstitutional. The same thing we have this, this um, uh, let's say, kind of commendable intentions, good, good intentions, would turn out into awful consequences, into awful consequences. That's the, you can see this as the receiving food stamps, um, inflation. Then uh, uh, John Williams, a great American statistician, is recalculating usually uh, the government statistics because statistics in the United States became pretty unreliable. The same thing I think is happening in South Africa, uh, but in the United States even more so. In the Soviet Union, we didn't have statistics, uh, but now I would say that we don't have good labor statistics. I'm a labor statistician myself in the United States. Consumer price index, uh, if, for example, if prices for gas are going up, they would exclude gas as non-essential. If prices for food are going up, they would exclude food out of the something called core index or core stats. Uh, and so this is the, the um, statistics I remember um, in, in the um, in Soviet Union. Uh, was completely, I mean, it was just a form of economic propaganda. Um, Laura Dandea Tyson, American economist, she was economic advisor to Bill Clinton, and she wrote a book about comparative economies of socialist countries, in which she picked up Romania as the most successful, as the most successful uh, socialist country, uh, and Romania was uh, was completely destroyed by Ceausescu regime. And I traveled to Romania, and I saw that there's absolutely nothing there, and, uh, um, and, I, and I met one. Romanian economist, his name was Iona Draculescu, everybody called him Dracula, because <laughs> he's, he smelled alcohol even at 8 o'clock in the morning. And I, and I said, Dracula, how do you fake statistics? And he said, we don't fake statistics. I said, what do you mean, not fake? He said, we make statistics. <laughs> I said, what's the difference? He said, well, to fake, you need some statistics to fake. But to make, you make it out of scratch. <laughs> and I said, well, how do you do it out of scratch? He said, you, you just look at the ceiling, and then if you, look, if you look at the ceiling long enough, you see numbers, you take them down. I said, but well, I'm looking at the ceiling, I don't see any numbers. He said, well, have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you see, yeah, just put these numbers down and then go to the boss and the boss will correct you. That's, that's how they make, make they are making statistics. So they can see that, that there's something which is called uh, recovery today is not actually recovery. Uh, there's a, uh, we have pretty low unemployment, about 5%. However, labor force participation rate is the lowest in the United States history, especially among African Americans, 60 percent. That means out of 10 people of the working age in African American community, four do not work. Four do not work. So that's the, the nationally it's 64 percent. So, so it's still pretty. We can see this declining um, um, uh, labor force participation rate. Uh, you see, the people are dropping out. For what reason? That's a destruction of incentives, that's one thing. Then not suitable jobs, uh, 
maybe uh, some kind of informal employment in the other sector over time. And only old guys after uh, age 65 and over. A good friend of mine, Bob, Bob Higgs, he wrote about that, that many people who are responsible and saved for the old age now find that owing to the Fed policy, they cannot reap a positive real return. Uh, because if you will put money in the bank or in any other in any other guaranteed kind of savings scheme, then you will not get any any return. So they um, they just cannot afford to to retire to properly retire. Uh, so that's uh, Walter Williams is a uh, is a great American economist. Uh, um, that's uh, uh, we had a nice dinner with Herman and him uh, in Alexandria, Virginia uh, last uh, uh, spring. Uh, Walter is already 80 years old, but he is uh, is uh, just so full with energy. If any one of you are interested in in um, situation, especially with um, with African American community in the United States, he uh, he wrote a wonderful book called American Economy: a Minority View, uh, and then State Against the Blacks, uh, and then uh, he he just uh, made a great uh, great video about good intentions. And, and uh, he lived in South Africa. He uh, stayed with Leon. Uh, he is extremely fond of, uh, fond of uh, great fondness, remember, his days in South Africa and his uh, very close work with uh, Leon Wu and Free Market Foundation of, of South Africa. Then, uh, World Index of Economic Freedom. Uh, in the United States, we are losing economic freedom right now. Uh, United, when I came to the United States in 1989, the United States was number two in economic freedom after Switzerland. Now it's number 18, I think. 19? 19, huh? It's number 19. Uh, African country, Mauritius, is number six. Uh, then uh, we have a, a wonderful country, a former Soviet country, Estonia which is, I think, number 10 right now. Uh, so we have uh, countries which, uh, which were not free, uh, but they have found economic freedom, and, they, and economic freedom is the greatest ingredient of economic success, so greatest ingredient of economic success. Vote EFF. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to find out that, oh, this is the wrong kind. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Hayek, huh? Hayek, he, he wrote that. The curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. And this is one of the most important, I would say, lessons from Austrian School of Economics uh, uh, that we should, we should learn that this is a, um, that, that we really don't know much and Hayek, I mean, this is wrong Hayek, this is real Hayek. Uh, uh, different types, we talked about different types of social, this means it's another great Russian pattern. What's the difference between Russian and German pattern? That in Russian pattern, government owns everything. Everything belongs to the state. And, uh, and and the whole country is run like a post office, by, from the office of the postmaster general. And then there is a Nazi type, a German type, then when you have property rights declared, but these property rights are phony because you are actually not a real owner of the property. The government is telling you when to open, when to close, what prices to charge, what prices to, to pay, uh, whom to hire and whom to fire and all, and all like that. This is what we are going to, I think, both in South Africa and in the United States, that we have a huge regulatory state. And those people who are saying Sweden is a socialist country, amazingly enough, you will look, and Sweden regulations are much lower than in the United States, more than in the United States. And in Sweden or Finland, uh, they have more economic freedom, amazingly enough, than we do in the United States. Okay, so uh, this is our if anyone is interested in all this deadly statistics and things like that, I would be happy to email you. This is a Cuban store. That's what socialism leads um, to. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, that's the only thing that you can buy without special rationing coupons. 
and I asked, what is that? And I said, no, this is baking soda. And I foolishly said that you should put people who are in charge of baking soda in Cuba in charge of everything. And, uh, <laughs> and after that, uh, they didn't want to let me out of this prison island. <laughs> so these are the people who want to escape from Cuba. This is United States mission. That's the best looking U.S. mission I've ever seen. At least you can see the government is relatively frugal. <laughs> <laughs> this is fixer uppers in Cuba. And I would like to maybe to end my my kind of introduction with this with the quote <laughs> from from the only Marx that I like, and that would be Groucho Marx. 